Hi everyone and welcome to another JIT video. So today we're going to be talking about struct devirtualization. This feature is very cool because not many people know that .NET supports automatic struct devirtualization out of the box. When we say about devirtualization, we usually mean a type devirtualization through generic arguments, but this is not not it really. So struct devirtualization is a very fragile feature, unfortunately, but because what you have to do, you have to fulfill a set of criteria that has to be very specific for it in order to be able to even work. So there's some, there's some problems with it. There's some good things that we can do with it. And there's some things that will totally, totally surprise you because they're not expected and they look like bugs, but they're probably not bugs. And we're going to see what's up with that and try to explain the problem and solve the problem. So let's jump in. Let's start with the virtualization. So let me just paste this code here. And what we have here is a struct which implements an interface. And that interface has a single method called get. And we're going to implement that interface and we're going to just return four. So a very simple method, very simple thing to do. And of course, we were going to have a method called M, which we'll use to do the following. So what we'll do is we're going to create a interface called A, and we're going to instantiate it with S. And now we're going to return a get. So what's going to happen here if we jump to IL code, you're gonna see that the C sharp code, C sharp compiler actually generated a box instruction here because it knows that we have to deal with the value type and that value type has a virtual call in it. So it has to get box, unfortunately, under the current implementation. But what the JIT compiler did is in, it inlined this function. And while doing that, it noticed that it's a const so const can be just returned without any problems and there's no boxing in this situation. So that's very good because that actually proves that what we did is we effectively devirtualized the struct without any problems. Awesome, right? Very cool. Let's see now what we can do else with it because when we add one, for example, as you can see, it still got like folded into a const and this got evaluated at compile time. So it's five now and it's all good, right? Because these kinds of folds can be implemented very efficiently. But let's see now what happens when we add one from the other side. So now one is a const added from the left hand side and not on the right hand side. So it's not really a huge difference, but in generated code, it's actually a drastic difference because now what's going to happen is that we're going to box no matter what this is a boxing call and we're going to have our S our struct on the heap instead of a stack or anywhere really, because when this gets folded, it's really in a register and it doesn't have any presence but now what you're gonna see is that we box so what's the problem here well the problem is that the compilers usually when they're doing certain optimizations possibly this optimization as well they have something that we call items so item is a very specific pattern in code and when we look at the il code now what's going to happen is wherever we have this construct here and this construct here when you click on this as you can see this is a block so an item in this case is all of these instructions on their own mean something different than their uh, when in this sort of group here so in this group they mean just an instantiation and a box so this call this call here to get means something different and if we combine these two, then we have an item that we can detect and transform in the way that the compiler does, right? But when, you, when we introduce something like plus one here, we cannot effectively detect this pattern possibly because there's something that's getting in the way because when we have the, the optimal version here, as you can see, we have a box and that box is followed by a call to an instance. But uh, when we do the call from this side, for example, well, this still holds true, but when we reverse the order, it doesn't really hold true anymore because we have to introduce 
a load to a const here and now the pattern breaks. So I'm not sure if this is the way that it's implemented in code, but looking at different sort of compilers, you could tell that it's probably what what's happening here but it might be not true but there's still some of variation of this pattern happening here so to make matters worse if we introduce an empty and not needed call like this here the pattern is still going to break because we now introduced a duplication so that duplication means that this pattern cannot be applied and if we see a digit assembly then we have a problem again so that's one thing so um, like i said this is a very fragile feature because even the smallest change can break it and that's a problem okay so how to now let me leave this plus one here because we're gonna use it later so how could we do something with it so let's do something different let's have another method that uh, we're gonna change a bit so let's use our struct again but now let's not use the interface but upon returning let's say that our a will be an actual interface so it's going to be ia and our ia will call the get method so it's pretty much the same but the implementation and the resulting code will be different because now what's what's happening really is we're allocating this guy on the stack and this got effectively devirtualized although we're asking for an interface implementation here the compiler detects the JIT compiler detects that this is a struct and instead of doing that what we're gonna do is we're gonna allocate this on the stack and then call the method get and then return and a very interesting bit is the knob operation here because this is a release build. So we're doing this all in the release mode in x64. And for some reason, the compiler emitted a no operation here, which is strange, but okay, we can live with that. So this implementation is better. Although we would uh, in like production situations, probably this would be an argument that interface would be an argument here and we couldn't like deal with this in such a way, right? We would have to get that interface and do something with the interface and the virtualization would not work if we would introduce some extras here. So it's very fragile in that, in that sense, right? So let's see a, another example, which is bizarre and that's a very surprising thing that's gonna happen now. So I have these two methods, right? This one, boxes effectively but this one does not box and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at the method n and keep a close look on that generated code because magic is going to happen and let me remove this this sub expression here from m remember we're looking at m n let's remove that and surprise surprise everything got fixed so everything got folded into a const now. Although M and N are not related to each other in any way. So they don't share data, they don't share nothing. All, and as you can see, we just optimized everything by fixing a single method M, although we're using N. Why is that? So that's very surprising. And I was extremely surprised when I saw this the first time. I showed that to a bunch of people in the .NET community. They were surprised as well. Then I showed it to a bunch of people from Microsoft and they were surprised as well. So it has to do with uh, something that's called a JIT tiered compilation. So JIT tiered compilation could be enabled in .NET Core 2.1 and 2.0, if I believe. And it's by default in 3.1 uh, and 3.2 and, and it's gonna be enabled by default now. So it used to be that JIT had a, like a hot call and, and cold path. There were multiple JITs um, before, but now what, what we have is we have a tiered compilation. So tiered compilation means that in tier zero, we're just gonna compile stuff quickly and we're not gonna optimize it very well because what we're trying to do is we're trying to speed up the load times of uh, all of the things that we sort of care about of the application 
and the code will not be optimal. But under certain conditions where we know that we have a hot path, for example, we're going to go back to that method and recompile it. And uh, we're going to use all of the optimizations that we can. So this thing here that I'm just showing you now is related to that problem. But we're using a tool called SharpLab and we don't really know if this is using tier 0, tier 1 and perhaps the disassembler is broken in a way because that shouldn't, these two methods shouldn't affect each other, right? Well, the compiler is just, the decompiler is just fine, the disassembler is just fine, everything is fine. But we have to prove it, right? So let's prove now that this is related to tiered compilation and we're going to see how we can abuse that feature. All right, so let's jump into some real code. And I have the same example here. So I have these two methods, M and N. They're doing pretty much the same thing. And I'm just going to use a new instance of program. I'm going to call M and then I'm going to call M just to be sure that the JIT will compile them. And I'm just going to return OK. So we're, we're going to use a different disassembler now. Um, that's called WinDBG because WinDBG has support for .NET types and we can totally de decompile our application. So let's compile this first and let's see what's going to happen in WinDBG. So let me switch to WinDBG. Let's load the application. Let's go. Let's break. Let's dump the heap with a type called program because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a method table out of a class in order to be able to see what methods are method definition. So we have our method descriptions here. As you can see, we have a bunch of methods that are JIT compiled already. So let's look first at M and as you can see, they're quick JIT -ed. and the quick JIT version is a very slow version that actually boxes it's not really the performant version of a method, although it's, uh, you know, we're not using the virtualization here because uh, like I said, we're gonna box and this is the proof that we're gonna box here. But let's go and look at method N and the method N again is quick jitted and the implementation is a bit different than we saw in Sharp Lab because it's uh, allocating stuff on the stack, but we're still gonna box here. So it's not the same implementation as we had uh, when we're testing stuff in SharpLab. Well, maybe because SharpLab already compiles in tier one and we have to verify that first. So let's detach and let's see how can we force the compiler to compile something in G tier one, because that's not very obvious. We have to make this a hot code path and that could require like loop iterations, different things, and that may be not feasible. So there's a way to enforce that by using aggressive optimization. They're gonna end up in tier one anyways. So let's do that now and let's recompile and let's see what the result is going to be. So let's restart. And again, let's dump the heap with a specific type. Let's copy the MT information. So now I have two methods, M and N, and now we're gonna see a change and the change is optimized to one, as you can see. So now when we go to the code, we're gonna get an optimized version, which is much shorter. The allocation uh, call here is fast alloc. So it's a fast way to allocate stuff on the heap, but it's still on the heap. But now let's look at N because that got allocated on the heap before and like tier zero. So quick when it's quick jitted, but in tier one compilation, it's allocated on the stack. So that's very good. But now we have to somehow explain the situation why is it happening if we're gonna re remove this 
and everything is gonna fix itself because it totally will fix itself in this um, WinDBG as well. Well, let's look at something different now. So let's go here and let's do the following trick. Let's switch these methods around. And now, as you can see, N got optimized by default, but M didn't. So, as it turns out, the tiered compilation and fast compilation is really dependent on the ordering of the methods in the class. And that's, a, that's kind of a problem, but that's kind of cool um, because you can do certain things with it, which is interesting. And one of the things you can do is if you know that you want stuff, if you have a problem like that and you want N to get possibly optimized away, we can do it by, int by calling N first. So it, you can imagine that you have a certain startup or bootstrap method, which will call certain methods in certain order in order for, for them to be able to be compiled in the most efficient way. It's not ideal. It should just work, but it's not work, working currently. So this is what we have to do sometimes. And just to be sure, let me prove to you that this is not a bug in Sharp Lab. Let's do the following. Let's switch places. So let's call N first, then let's call M. And that will fix effectively the method N. And it would fix every single method that we were going to have in that class. So every single method will get optimized that can get optimized. So if you call M, which is the slowest version of the method first, everything will not get optimized. But if you do it in the reversed order, everything will get optimized instead uh, that can be optimized. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. That's related probably to the tiered compilation and it's probably still related to inlining as well because the folding, in order to be able to fold like that, you have to inline the function get. But let's test it out. So we switched places. So now we're just calling N and then M. So what's gonna happen now? So let's dump the heap again let's get the method table let's go to m first so as you can see m got unchanged nothing really changed in m but now let's see the method n and as you can see it got optimized and folded into a const which is awesome so this is, uh, this is a very interesting feature currently. It's not all that useful because it's very sort of like hidden. It should just work, but the, the, the algorithm that the text, uh, the, con the conditions that you have to fulfill is very tricky to do. And currently you have to be very aware what you're doing in order to be able to use this feature correctly. So perhaps in the future, it's going to get implemented a bit better and uh, that will be awesome. But for now, you have to be very aware that this exists and you have to be aware of all of these situations that I've just shown you because otherwise you cannot really use this effectively. And it's really effective when you think about it because it can fold stuff, it can optimize stuff, it can devirtualize stuff. So it's something that in like performance critical scenarios you have, you want to do. So that's, um, that's something to consider. So if you liked the video, uh, leave a like, possibly subscribe, uh, leave a comment. If you have any suggestions, if you found some bugs, possibly we're going to try and fix them in the description and that's all for this video. So thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.